Welcome to this edition of Theological Journals, 207 p.m. 7-3-2020. The Anglican Journal, paper from Canada, devastating news. McDonald's acknowledged sexual misconduct stuns the church. News of former national adult indigenous Anglican Archbishop. Mark McDonald's resignation due to sexual misconduct allegations has shocked many in the church, with indigenous and non-indigenous leaders describing both the emotional and practical challenges in coming to terms with it. McDonald resigned as the National Indigenous Archbishop and formally relinquished his exercise of ordained ministry. April 20, following allegations of sexual misconduct. In a pastoral letter to the church, Archbishop Linda Nichols, primate of the Anglican Church of Canada, said MacDonald had acknowledged the sexual misconduct. His resignation took effect in accordance with Canon 19 on relinquishment or abandonment of ministry. The primate confirmed to the Anglican Journal that there are no allegations of criminal offenses. This is devastating news, Nichols said in her pastoral letter. The sense of betrayal is deep and profound when leaders fail to live up to the standards we expect and the boundaries that we set. Our hearts hold compassion for human frailty and space for repentance while we also ache with the pain that such betrayal causes first to the complainant and to so many others in the life of our church. We'll pick that up next time in a few more days. Turn to Trinity Theological Journal. Philip Durstein on the ancient Israelite calendar. The word Hodesh, Ritmij, shining, glittering, new moon, has continued to be its primary meaning in Jewish Midrashic tradition, so that Hodesh in Exodus 12.12 was understood to be the new moon rather than the month. This yields the following. This new moon shall be the first new moon of the year for for you. Rashi accounts for the modification of Hodesh by the demonstrative adjective Hazeh in terms of God didactically pointing his finger at the first moon of the year. His concept would have been familiar to Moses because, though not generally recognized, it was no later than the early 18th dynasty that Egyptians made use of the first visible crescent to solemnize a wide variety of important royal and cultic events. Philo, a spokesman for the normative Judaism in the time of Christ, described the Jewish new moon as follows. Now the third festival is that which comes after the conjunction Metasunavim which happens on the day of the new moon in each month, Kata Selene Neon. In the same book, Philo is even more explicit. At the time of the new moon, the sun begins to illuminate the moon with light, which is visible. The Hebrew word for new moon, Hodesh, in several contexts refers to the first day of the Hebrew month, Exodus 12, 2, Exodus 19, 1. Numbers 28.14, Deuteronomy 16.1. A meaning mirrored by Philo's use of Selene and Neon. Philo's statement bridges the Second Temple period and much later rabbinic writings, which also understood the moon which begins to shine in the first of the month. Return to Anglican and Episcopal history on Lambeth Conferences and Historiography. 
Stevenson named 10 figures as belonging to this alleged party. Samuel uh, Longley, Wilberforce, Fulford, Lewis, Hopkins, White House, Gray, Selwyn, Christopher Wordsworth, Ernst Hawkins, and others. It is a list that presents both a historiographical problem and an ecclesiastical insight. On the one hand, Stevenson offered no evidence that these figures self-identified as a party, much less that they conceived of themselves as both moderate and high. The term moderate high churchman was not a neologism in Stevenson's work. It can be found in some other mid-20th century historical writings and was in use at least by the middle 1860s when purported moderation served to distinguish this group from the generally classed advanced high churchmen, that is, Tractarians, and especially as the century moved on, ritualists. However, by classifying various personages with one or another party label, including labels that contemporaries may not even have recognized, Stevenson was following what was, by his time, a very familiar tradition within Anglicanism. Church parties had been a defining feature of Anglican life since W.J. Coinybear published his famous essay, Church Parties, in 1853. Nonetheless, the descriptive ac accuracy of Stevenson's label, Moderate High Churchman, still awaits validation. On the other hand, and perhaps more importantly, Stevenson's list of ten personages is notable because it roots the Lambeth Conference and by extension the Anglican Communion as a self-conscious ecclesial identity in an international framework larger than England. Longley was Archbishop of Canterbury and Wilberforce, Bishop of Oxford. Wordsworth was an Archdeacon of Westminster and Hawkins its canon. <coughs> but the other Lewis was a Bishop of Ontario. Fulford was a Bishop of Montreal and the first Anglican metro Metropolitan of Canada. Hopkins was the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church in White House, the bishop of Illinois. Selwyn was the metropolitan of New Zealand, and Gray, the archbishop of Cape Town, South Africa. From the vantage point of the present, this might appear as merely an Anglo-centric Benjamin Wakiti for, for Anglo-centric. Benjamin Mwakiti, for example, wrote that the leadership of the first nine Lambeth conferences came from beans that were all from the same pod. But in 1967, against the background of mid-20th century decolonization, the geographical dis description of Stevenson's moderate high church party rendered the Lambeth Conference and Anglican Communion a joint product of both center and periphery, both metropole and post-colony, whereas Davidson found it strange to say that Lambeth Conference began with those outside of England. Stevenson did not. The purported existence of an international moderate high church party rendered such a development all but inevitable. We turn to the Lambeth Conferences and Michael Ramsey. More widely, the mid-1960s saw Ramsey being drawn into a wider controversies of politics and society, which seemed to demand a Christian response. The war in Vietnam presented numerous opportunities for risky public comment and action, 
not least a joint statement with other British religious leaders in February 1968, and a World Council of Churches initiative for peace shortly afterwards, at a time when the Church of England was pressing greater independence from the state. Give me a second here. Ramsey was prepared to criticize governments for greater, more prophetic stance. Ramsey criticized British government policy both before and after unilateral declaration of independence by the white minority government of southern Rhodesia. In Parliament, Ramsey advocated for the use a military force, if necessary, on behalf of the black majority. As the colonial power, nothing could damage us more in the eyes of African countries than to uphold the cause of justice with the same constancy in every situation. The resulting media storm was the largest of Ramsey's career. At home, Ramsey well knew that the treatment of re religious and racial minorities in Britain affected the lives of Christian minorities everywhere. He was publicly and controversially involved in issues of race relations, both on behalf of immigrants from the Commonwealth who were already resident in the UK and in March 1968 on behalf of the Kenyans of Asian descent, forced out by the Kenyatta government. Weeks later came the shock of the assassination of Martin Luther King. In July, Ramsey flew home early from the WCC assembly in Uppsala to speak in parliament in support of what became the Race Relation Act, Race Relations Act just days before the Lambeth Conference opened. And now for our third article on the Lambeth Conferences and international relations. In 1899 and 1907, two vital conferences at Hague brought the conduct of international relations in wartime to a new, still higher ground. These discussions, the first initiated by the Russian government, and the second by President Theodore Roosevelt, now occurred in the Netherlands. The conventions which came of them created a new international court. Although Lambeth Conferences of 1908 received a vigorous committee report on the moral witness of the church, which considered the new democratic ideal and social economic questions, this did not touch on the questions of international diplomacy. But the Hague Conventions were noticed, perhaps as much touched by the 17th century 17th Universal Peace Congress held in London that year. The bishops welcomed the achievements of the Second Hague Conference and a single composite resolution in which it was rejoiced in the presence of higher ethical perceptions, which is evidenced by the increasing willingness to settle difficulties among nations by peaceful methods. It is recorded in gratitude for the principles of international responsibility acknowledged by the delegates and urges upon all Christian peoples the duty of allaying racial prejudice. And promoting this among all races, the spirit of brotherly cooperation for the good of mankind. This resolution offered important development of three resolutions of 1897, where they might have been stranded in history and forgotten. 
as it was, such pronouncements began to secure a firm place in the purpose of the Lambeth Conferences and in their earlier evolution. <clears throat> now for the standard bearer on issues here, letters of response to the May issue on sexual misconduct in the churches. Editors, again, please know that this is not an attack on Reverend Key. I only desire to share with you my concerns with how this article may have negatively affected victims and how it has left me a non-victim with confusion. My purpose in writing is to encourage you to continue the difficult and ugly discussion of sexual abuse when and where you have opportunity in all of its truth, shining the light and hope of the gospel over against the evil of this heinous sin that has infected and been kept hidden in the PRC for decades. Together, you and I know and confess that there is hope in Christ for victims. But that hope, that truthful, beautiful hope must come with and after a full understanding and acknowledgement of what abuse does to the body, mind, and soul of the victim. I'm not so foolish to claim to know and understand it fully. I never will. I only hope to give you my perspective from my conversations with victims. May God grant us all the boldness to speak the truth, the humility to listen and to learn how this sin is uniquely devastating, the compassion of our response to the victims, and the wisdom of our response to the perpetrator. Give me a second here to look at this. With love in Christ. Vicki Nelson. This is the June edition. We have one here. Another letter. Name withheld. I appreciate the desire of the magazine to educate those in the denomination concerning abuse. It is not easy to be an abuse victim in the PRC denomination. The pressure for victims to be silent so that abusers and even their families can feel comforted comfortable is great. It is also not easy to be a victim when your abuser was considered the godliest man in the congregation and was always an elder. It was in my abuser's job description as an elder to protect God's people. However, his actions were a far cry from protection. My abuser killed every one of his victims not physically, because our hearts still beat, but spiritually and emotionally, he murdered each one of us. When I read Reverend Key's meditation and read his words such as embracing their victimhood, and easier to be a victim than wallow in bitterness, I felt immense sadness, not only for the victims of abuse, but for those who support us. I am thankful for the support of my loved ones as I travel through the sea for a time. For a husband who sees my brokenness and doesn't equate it with bitterness. Who patiently and graciously stands by my side. For a mother and father who must not only support their daughter, but also grieve for what has been lost. I could call them five days five times a day to tell them I don't blame them, yet to no avail. The guilt at times overwhelms both. For a sister who has never presented me to me a timetable, for how long she thought my journey of grief should last or what it should look like, I will never cease to thank my father for placing these specific per people on my path. Reverend Keyes stated that for some, it is easier to choose to remain a victim and embrace that better state. I wonder then, would he think, think victims always have had choices? 
I would like to take him back to a moment in time, a time when there was a girl lying on the couch with an elder, a man whose hands were all over the child as she lay on the couch. Did I have the choice to get off that couch, the choice to tell my parents? For, the, for, the, for victims, this is where Reverend Key's statements and line of thinking lead us. One more hurdle is placed on our path to recovery and it didn't come from our abuser. <clears throat> to assume victims embrace their victimhood, cast shadow and dims the light on our story of justice and redemption. I don't sing anymore in church, or at least I haven't for a while. However, I listen and the words are for me great comfort my favorite verse comes from Psalters number 73, stanza 5. My heart had failed in fear and woe, unless in God I had believed, assured that he would mercy show, and that my life his grace should know, or was my hope deceived. I listen to these words and the tears fall, but I listen with such hope. Hope and knowing that not only is everything going to be okay, but it has to be okay. It has to be okay because of who God is and everything he has promised in his word. Reverend Key's response. The letters received indicate clearly the pain suffered by those who have been abused. There is a reason the church must treat the sin of sexual abuse as sin against the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. We grieve and pray for healing for those who have suffered and continue to suffer the effects of this trauma. I regret using those two sentences referred to, seeing they have been understood by some to mean get over it, move on or a kick to them to get jump started in order to meet the timetable of our demands. The readers of the standard bearer must understand that there is never a getting over the memories of trauma, be it sexual assault or other traumatic events in our lives. There will always be a recurrence of memories, sometimes at moments that might make those memories as painful as when they occurred. Memories that will often unleash a flood of emotions and thoughts. But it's also easy in the face of trauma to get trapped in unhealthy thoughts, and I do mean trapped. So Satan would abuse us from uh, keeping us from knowing and embracing the power of the face of trauma. That speaks to the urge of spiritual counseling that would restore to us gospel ministry in addressing our brokenness, which is to say it is necessary for our spiritual progress that we progress, progress, progress from victims to survivors in processing our drama, trauma. Careful biblical counseling is often necessary to help and embrace a healthy way of confronting what I call, referred to as the demons of memories and how the merciful work of our Heavenly Father gives healing and perspective even to the trauma of our lives. It was the intention of the standard bearer in publishing the special issue on this difficult subject not only that we as churches grow in our understanding and treatment of this sin of devastation, but also that those who've been the objects of abuse be encouraged to seek out help necessary to overcome and know themselves to be more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. We turn our attention to table talk. When to take a life, July 27. Just check.
check the head here. Give me a second as I look ahead. Many people have memorized the sixth commandment in the King James King James translation, which says, "Thou shalt not kill." As we saw in our last study, however, the sixth commandment is more narrowly focused, and the King James translation suggests the sixth commandment does not outlaw all killing; rather, it speaks against taking of innocent life. Its concern is with unlawful killing, hence the English Standard Version, you shall not murder. Scripture gives us cases in which taking a human life is just and an appropriate action. Yes, God alone has the absolute right to take a life because he is the author of life itself. Nevertheless, he's granted to men and women the right to kill in select circumstances. Today's passage, we read Genesis 9, 5, and 6. For your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it, and from man. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man... By man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. Today's passage wherein we read of God's instituting capital punishment is one place where the right to kill is granted. After the great flood in Noah's day, God entered into a covenant with all creation. And in this covenant he calls his image bearers to shed the blood of human beings who have unmercifully killed others. The reasoning behind this is rooted in the fact that human beings are made in the image of God. Murder is, in many respects, the greatest display of hostility toward our Creator than any person can show. We cannot end the life of God, so the closest we can ever try to killing Him is to murder one of his image bearers. To kill a divine image bearer unlawfully is really to show a willingness to kill God because of how he has imparted to us a special likeness to himself. Such a brazen assault on our creator cannot be tolerated. So those who commit what we would call first degree murder must be executed executed if their guilt can be legitimately proved. We are granted to kill another person in cases of self-defense, such as such passages as Exodus 22, 2 and 3 indicate. If a thief can be killed when he invades another person's home to steal material goods, certainly someone can be killed if he is attempting to kill someone and thereby steal the victim's life. Yet note that Exodus 22, 2 and 3 does not get, grant an absolute right to kill someone, for the killing is lawful only if it happens at night, presumably because the day it is easier to see that there might be other ways to stop the intruder without killing him. The idea is that killing in self-defense is legitimate when there's no other way to stop an army, uh, <clears throat> to stop an enemy from doing harm. July 28, protect, proactively protecting life. Deuteronomy 22.8, when you build a new house, you shall make a parapet for your roof. You may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house if anyone should fall from it. Exodus 20, 13 prohibits the law, unlawful taking of life, reminding us that human beings have no absolute right to take the lives of other people. 
the civil magistrate after a just trial with witnesses is to execute someone who has committed a capital crime. When our lives or the lives of others are threatened, and there's no other way to save the innocent except by lethal force against an attacker, then killing as an act of self-defense is lawful. This includes killing when one is part of an army participating in a just war. In other circumstances, however, human beings are not allowed to take the lives of other people. The Sixth Commandment tells us what not to do with respect to the taking of human life, and in so doing also enjoys a positive duty, mainly to protect life. Various other commandments in the scriptures show us this. Deuteronomy 22.8 is one of the best examples of a commandment given to proactively protect life that we find in scripture. God told the people of Israel to build parapets or fences on the borders of their roads to prevent from incurring blood guilt. The ancient Israelites spent a lot of time on their roads, using them for entertaining or other gatherings so that there was a real danger that people could fall to their deaths, whether they were at the house or visiting someone else. The Lord therefore instructed them to fence their roads to keep them from falling off, thereby protecting life. Matthew Henry comments on this, that we should note two things in particular from this verse. First, how precious men's lives are to God who protects them not only by his providence, but by his law. Second, how precious, therefore, they ought to be to us, and what care we should take to prevent hurt from coming to any person. The Lord considers human life so important that he provides not only laws to prevent international taking of life, but also laws designed to prevent the loss of human life by accident. This should impress on us our duty to proactively protect life through reasonable safety measures. We might not need to build a fence on our roads, but we might need to make sure that young children cannot access a swimming pool. We might need to establish proper protocols for the use of heavy equipment. We drive carefully. So to protect ourselves and other drivers, there are a number of ways that we could apply this principle behind today's passage, but the main point is that we should seek to protect life at any given stage. Now for July 29, Matthew 5, 21 to 26. You've heard that it was said of God, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the fire of hell. 1 Samuel 16 describes the anointing of David to replace Saul as king of Israel, narrating for us the most important moments in redemptive history. In doing so, it gives us a key principle for biblical ethics that applies to all of God's people. He judges the heart. Our creator is concerned with our hearts with our motives, with our thoughts, not only with our outward behavior. The Ten Commandments, therefore, address not only our actions, but the state of our hearts behind them. In fact, to do what any of the commandments forbid starts with the violation of the law in the heart. That is part of what we learn in today's message. Jesus makes it clear that we break the sixth commandment not only if we commit actual murder, 
but are angry with another person without a just cause. Matthew 5, 21 to 26. Murder is the fruit of anger. For unlawful killing is always motivated by anger. So if we do not mortify unjust anger, it could lead to murder. We should be clear here that Jesus is not saying that an unjust anger is as an un un heinous as the actual murder of another person. God's law, after, or, after all, mandates the death penalty for murder and not for anger. Yet the broader implications of the Sixth Commandment address anger. And indeed, the Sixth Commandment was given not only to prevent murder, but also to show us that we have broken the law when we irrationally and unjust, when we, broke, when we are irrationally and unjustly angry with others. Thus, even those who have never killed someone have broken the Sixth Commandment and we have not sought to purge the sinful anger from our hearts. It is, of course, possible to be angry without sinning. After all, Scripture tells us that God is angry and with the wicked every day, and, and he is perfectly righteous. Yet we must acknowledge how difficult it is for human beings to be angry in a righteous manner. So it is wise to deal with our anger immediately and to seek to put it away before it festers and becomes an occasion for further sin. If we seek to be slow to anger and to repent of our unjust and sinful anger, then we will be well on our way to keeping the sixth commandment. We can do this only in the power of the Holy Spirit as we seek to put to death all that is ungodly within our hearts and minds. I turn to Biblia Thika Sacra, with the article on a chronology of the life of Christ with an emphasis on the Nativity and Epiphany. The conclusion that March 25 Annunciation antedated December 25 Nativity is also historically insupportable. Hippolytus, the younger contemporary of Africanus, subscribed to the December 25 Nativity, as may be seen in his commentary on Daniel and the Chronicon. However, Hippolytus placed Christ's conception at Passover, April 2. That Hippolytus accepted the December 25 nativity while rejecting March 25 conception indicates that the former had entirely separate provenance and was established and accepted within the Christian community before the latter attained broad consensus. However, that is not to say that the calculation theory is entirely without merit. That early computists and chronographers made at least some calculations of the sort described seems indisputable and may be granted. In fact, we can see the process in motion as early writers tended to place the Annunciation first in the Passover season then on Passover itself, finally on March 25. However, since the date most earlier writers assigned for Jesus' birth was the 42nd year of Augustus, Passover was not on March 25 that year. Writers like Hippolytus, who placed Christ's conception on Passover, naturally resisted adopting March 25 for the date of Annunciation. Typologically, it could be argued that Jesus was conceived on Passover day, but historically there was no basis to assign that to March 25. For these writers, Passover was the important and controlling factor in searching for a date to assign the Annunciation, not a highly artificial state in the Julian calendar. 
However, with the time, the symbolism associated with the equinox and solstice and the symmetry thus achieved apparently persuaded men to abandon dates with greater historical and scriptural grounding in favor of the triad of the Julian dates, ostensibly pioneered by Africanus. Some wonkiness there. We turn to modern Reformation evangelicals in the Bible, the May June issue, and the article on redeeming Eve, restoring Eve, I believe that is, by Kendra Dahl. More specifically, as we look at the narrative of the fall, beginning in Genesis 3, 1. Give me a second here. This covenantal understanding helps us to see what is happening in the text, the covenantal test of obedience, and what is not. Though we see in the fall narrative that Satan is bent on upending the created order, the same motivation cannot be applied to Eve. The text indicates that by listening to the voice of the serpent, she has brought, bought into the lie that she can be like God. The text does not indicate, however, that she refused to obey the voice of her husband who was with her, nor does it indicate a domineering pressure to coerce her husband into disobedience. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. If the account of the fall demonstrated Eve as a usurper of male authority, then we may justify foe's adversarial understanding of the woman's desire. But any discussions about Eve's motivation must be imported into the text since neither here nor elsewhere in scripture is the fall characterized as Eve usurping Adam's authority. In brief, the narrative does not characterize Eve as exalting herself above Adam, but rather exalting herself above her creator. That does not mean the text has nothing to say about relational dynamics between Adam and Eve. Sin does refracture the couple's love and unity evidenced by their shame and separation over their newly realized nakedness. Meredith Klein calls the fall the first divorce. Adam's words illustrate the conflict that will now characterize fallen relationships. The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. But is the emphasis here their marriage their different sexes or their new sin tainted posture toward each other. Paul describes life prior to faith in Christ in terms of this relational dysfunction, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our times in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. These sinful attitudes and behaviors do not discriminate on the basis of sex. Further, if Genesis 3 intended to show that the woman possessed an inherent desire to usurp, surely the rest of the biblical evidence would attest this. However, where there are examples of women who do usurp, that which is not rightfully theirs. There are also a couple examples of men who do so. The narratives throughout the rest of Genesis and the Old Testament do not demonstrate a battle of the sexes, or rather a battle of the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, often expressed through the conflict of brothers. Human beings were created to live in harmony with God and with one another, but sin disrupts these relationships. This is an undoubtedly evidenced in the text, in the rest of Scripture, and in our own experiences. When we witness Adam and Eve hiding from faith, pointing fingers at each other, 
we are meant to be grieved, how far they have fallen. We'll pick that up next, and we are in, again, Modern Reformation, the July-August issue, who says in solving doctrinal controversies. Lost and Found, Calvin's Sermons on the Scrap Heap by Zachary Purvis. He is a Dr. Purvis, lecturer of church history at Edinburgh Theological Seminary, author of Theology in the University in 19th Century Germany. His articles have appeared in such venues as the Journal of History of Ideas, Church History and Journal of Ecclesiastical History. In 1823, the brothers William and Adolf Monad entered a junk shop in Geneva. A mysterious volume, unusually old and musty, caught their attention. When they examined it closely, the smudged ink inside resolved into letters and letters into words. The script might have misled other men, but William and Adolf came from a line of French reform ministers and studied theology themselves. Soon they identified its contents, nothing less than manuscript sermons from John Calvin. For a pittance, they bought the set to which it belonged, eight folio volumes in all, for the clerk had priced it only by weight in the paper. They sent their treasure to Geneva's public library for safekeeping. The episode seemed surprising. In fact, the odyssey of Calvin's sermons from delivery to scrap heap, from discovery to preservation, is filled with remarkable twists. We begin with the Bourse Francais, a charity organization in Geneva that help destitute immigrants and finance religious instruction. In 1549, the Bourse hired Dennis Roganier, himself a French refugee, as Calvin's stenographer. Calvin entered the pulpit without notes, so Roganier recorded what he said in shorthand and afterwards transcribed it into longhand. There had been repeated attempts to write down Calvin's sermons and lectures as he spoke. Many tried to do this. Theodore Beza said in his early biography of Calvin, but they had not yet been able to write everything down word for word. Regnier opened a new world and grew in ability as he went. The first sermons were recorded in 1549 ran to an average of 4,000 words each. The sermons he took down in 1550 and 51 on Micah were 5,000 words. The sermons he transcribed in 1556 and 59 on Isaiah ran to 7,000 words. It was Roganier's handwriting that the Menard brothers deciphered in the junk heap. Because Calvin preached without notes, though not without preparation, the transcribed sermons did not shine with the same polish as those texts that Calvin composed for print. William Farrell complained to him about this. I would have liked it if you worked on your discourse with more care as you usually do. But Calvin was famously overburdened with work. Furthermore, he preached to the flesh and blood audience before him, even when that meant sacrificing style or brevity. No one had a sharper sense of the importance of the genre. Biblical commentaries were not sermons. Sermons were not lectures. Lectures were not treatises. No one knew more the distance between oral and written discourse case of Psalm 119, for example, Calvin confessed his preference to print a brief commentary when the time was right, rather than to fill the sheet with so many long passages 
such as in the pulpit. We turn now to Calvin's Theological Journal, The Beatitudes, by Gerard Cesar. If he's been talking about pentheo, mourning, blessed are those who mourn. If we approach the meaning of mourning from another angle, we arrive at essentially the same place. Wheelock notes that the first two Beatitudes are aligned with Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, where the poor and those who mourn are mentioned in the two verses, respectively. In the first ser- verse, the servant of the Lord is sent to preach good news to the poor and bind up the brokenhearted. Might Matthew have confined, combined the poor and the brokenhearted into the poor of spirit? Regardless, what follows in Isaiah is a lengthy description of how comfort will be brought to those who mourn. What is clear is that this mourning is that which grows out of having suffered significant loss, whether the death of a loved one or calamity. Those who mourn has the more comprehensive sense of Isaiah 61, 2, and 3 an inclusive grief that refers to the disenfranchised, contrite, and bereaved. It is an expression of the intense sense of loss, helplessness, and despair. Powell puts it this way, if the poor in spirit are those who find no reason for hope in this life, and the ones who mourn are those who find no cause for joy. Although a different Greek word for mourning is used than is used than in our beatitude, the familiar account of Rachel weeping for her children in Matthew two eighteen, because they are not, illustrates the point that we mourn significant losses. Now I turn to the seventeenth beatitude and the peacemakers. An initial look at the second and seventh Beatitudes poses the strongest obstacles to the chiastic relationship that this article proposes. However, on further investigation, it may be the most persuasive of the proposed relationships. If each Beatitude is viewed as an isolated statement, Peacemakers are commonly described as those who help resolve conflicts. Allowing the chiastic relationship between these two Beatitudes to inform what it means to be a peacemaker points in a different direction, though not one mutually exclusive with resolving difficulties. The Jewish concept of peace, shalom, meets the needs of those who mourn. Now for Westminster Theological Journal on social Trinitarianism and the third article of theology proffered by Hobbits. Ten principles. The third article theology, which we'll call TAT, begins with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is not a postscript. Cat looks through the spirit at the other theological loci, theological method, rather than merely at the spirit. Pneumatology. Tat precedes first and second articles of theologies, where the spirit is the Christian's first point of contact for participation in the divine life. Hi, Mary. Good to see you. Number four, TAT complements but does not compete with first and second article theologies. It is fully committed to Trinitarian theology. Number five, TAT recognizes that the Spirit continues to speak to the church today in a retroactive movement of triune discourse, retroactive or pneumatic hermeneutics. Six, Tat engages the mission for, of the triune God in the world, applied theology, ethics, worship, mission. 
Number seven, Tat is Christocentric and crucicentric in accord with the spirit Christology. Number eight, Tat emphasizes the eschatological nature of the triune God's mission in the world, which is proleptically incorporated into the overarching dogmatic method. Number nine, Tat emphasizes the Holy Spirit's sanctifying work to bring believers to greater degrees of holiness or Christification. Number 10, Tat is thoroughly ecumenical in that, number one, it's committed to the historic creeds and confessions. Two, is desirous of doctrinal unity among the divided Christian traditions. After articulating the methodological criteria for TAT, Abbott clarifies these criteria form a very general locus of agreement around which all essayists in the third article theology concur to a greater or lesser extent. However, since Habits presents these new criteria, I will now in evaluate them as though they are represented representative of his own position. Evaluation of the methodological criteria. I commend habits for endeavoring to rectify the putative neglect of the spirit in historical and contemporary theology and for prizing traditional Trinitarian categories. Habits reveals his fidelity to the latter, for example, in his critique of contemporary Pentecostal scholarship, where he rejects social Trinitarianism and tritheism, as well as affirms inseparable operations, the coordination of the divine processions and the temporal missions and the Christological center of Trinitarian theology. Next, I'm amenable to Habit's retroactive hermeneutic. As Habit's explains elsewhere, it is the spirit of light who illuminates the significance of the Christ event. Retro, it is the presence of the spirit of life that moves the church forward. It is the spirit of truth who brings the word of God into new situations. In addition, I applaud Habit's commitment to the life of the church and kingdom of God, ensuring that his method includes ethical, doxological, and missional applications. I also appreciate his eschatological emphasis, connecting the spirit to the work and person of Christ and the body of Christ. Finally, I endorse Habit's affirmation of the Spirit's sanctifying work in believers and his commitment to the historic creeds and confessions of the Church. With these commendations, however, come a few concerns and critiques. And we will pick that up again. Mid-America Theological Journal. Uh, Dr. Van Amen's, Cornelius Van Amen's article on should effectual calling and regeneration be distinguished. Interestingly, in the article that follows this description of the Holy Spirit's inward work that accompanies the gospel, outward proclamation, the canons of Dort, use the term in regeneration for the first time. Regeneration is defined in the narrow sense as a work performed by the spirit that is entirely supernatural and ultimately hidden and inexpressible. The work of regeneration in this sense is comparable to a new creation the raising from the dead, and the making alive so clearly proclaimed in the scriptures with which God works in us without our help, Article 12. 
Faith and repentance are genuinely human responses to the word in which believers willfully, willingly, I'm sorry, and gladly embrace the promise of the gospel. But faith and repentance occur only in consequence of a preceding act of the Spirit in new birth. The act of the Spirit in regeneration surpasses the power of outward teaching or moral suasion through the word that leaves with it, leaves it within the man's power whether or not to be converted. Rather, it is entirely supernatural work, one that is at the same time powerful and most pleasing, a marvelous, hidden, and inexpressible work, which is not lesser than or inferior to power, to that of the creation or of raising the dead, as scripture teaches. As a result, all those in whose hearts God works in this marvelous way are certainly, unfailingly, and effectively reborn and do actually believe. And then the will, now renewed, is not only activated by God, but is being activated by God also. For this reason, man himself by that grace which he has received, is also rightly said to repent and believe. Article 11 of the Canons of Dort. We turn to the Global Anglicanism and a new article, John Owen and the Dangers of Biblicism, by Rich Duncan. The abstract of the article is this. Many Christians will feel indignant when isolated Bible verses are quoted to support the views of obviously non-Christian groups, such as the Jehovah Witnesses. Yet we perhaps should be even more concerned when this selective approach to scriptures is adopted by those who position themselves within the church this article, and the title of the article here is John Owen on the Dangers of Biblicism. This article seeks to show that a superficial engagement with the Bible may provide ovine dress for the proponents of the most insidious and systematic error. 17th century Socinianism will be the case study for this cautionary tale, with the interaction of John Owen used as a foil. By outlining the Socinian methodology and theology below, and drawing upon the insight of its most prolific and prodigious detractor, the aim is to offer a doctrinal shot in the arm carefully controlled exposure to deadly heterodoxy administered to build up immunity against transmission of modern variants. Give me a second here. The Puritans disagreed on much, but they were united in their opposition to three foes, Roman Catholicism, Arminianism, and Socinianism. The third of these is the least understood by most Christians today, despite the enduring prevalence of its ideas in certain quarters, and despite John Owen identifying it as the gravest affront to Christ. Greater understanding of the Socinian heresy is long overdue, as until recently. The Socinians received little modern-day scholarly attention. Treatments a decade ago by Saren Mortimer and Paul Lim both observed the relative paucity of engagement with the movement in academic literature during the previous half-century, with both seeking to redress what Lim termed the strange lacuna. 
Then five years ago, Lee Gaddis provided a critical overview of the historical and theological context of John Owen's extensive interaction with English Socinianism and Lee Gaddis, an art Anglican, his article Socinianism and John Owen in the South Southern Baptist Journal of Theology. However, despite this welcome resurgence of interest in recent times, an awareness of Socinians is yet to filter down into the wider Christian consciousness. This article will address this lack of familiarity. Very nice, Socinianism. Now we turn to Dean Dyson Hagg in the Fundamentals of the Truth, published in 1909, an Anglican at Wycliffe College, professor of theology. He's been dealing with the Grafville Housians and the modern higher critics, which is a term I don't use. I call them decadent critics, vandals, Visigoths, not obscurantists. This is a subcategory. It's very necessary to have our minds made perfectly clear on this point and to re remove not a little of misunderstanding. The desire to re receive all the light that the most fearless search for truth by the highest scholarship can yield is the desire of every true believer in the Bible. No really healthy Christian mind can advocate obscurantism. The obscurant who opposes the investigation of scholarship and would throttle the investigators has not the spirit of Christ. In heart and attitude, he's a medievalist. To use Bushnell's famous apologue, he would try to stop the dawning of the day by wringing the neck of the crawling cock. No one wants to put the Bible in a glass case, but it is the duty of every Christian who belongs to the noble army of truth lovers to test all things and to hold fast that which is good. He also has rights, even though he has, technically speaking, he may be unlearned, and to accept any view that contradicts his spiritual judgment simply because it is that of a so-called scholar is to ab abdicate his franchise as a Christian and his birthright as a man. See the excellent little work by Professor Kennedy, Old Testament Criticism and the Rights of the Unlearned by F.H. Ravel, and in his right of private judgment, he is aware that while the privilege of investigation is conceded to all, the conclusions of an avowedly prejudiced scholarship must be subjected to a particularly searching analysis. The most ordinary Bible reader is, is learned enough to know that the investigation of the book that claims to be supernatural by those who are avowed enemies of all that is supernatural and the study of subjects that can be understood only by men of humble and contrite spirit, by men who are admittedly irreverent in spirit, must certainly be received with caution. C. Parker's striking work, None Like It, by F. H. Ravel, and The Last Address. We'll pick this up again. It's a brilliant article. As we turn to Dr. Michael Reeves, commenting on uh, the book is Theologians You Should Know. And he's dealing with the Apostolic Fathers here with the uh, letter to Diognetus in the second century. His argument in the letter continues with a defense of the innocence of Christians. 
Yet he maintains what the soul is to the body, Christians are to the world. That is, as the soul is in the body, but not of it, so Christians are in the world, and so, like souls, are despised. And just as the soul is improved by fasting, so Christians increase when persecuted. Finally, amid an explanation, this is in the letter to Diognetus, of how God has shown his love to us sinners in sending Christ for our salvation. The author urges Diognetus to acquire the joyous, joyous knowledge of God for himself. Quote, then you will admire those who for righteousness' sake endure the transitory fire. Remember, there were persecutions going on. And you will consider them blessed when you compromend, comprehend that other fire. And again, the author makes it clear that the coming judgment was a prime consolation for the persecuted Christians. We move on now to another apostolic document, the letter of Barnabas. The last of the apostolic fathers is an anonymous letter, allegedly written by the apostle Paul's companion, Barnabas. It is often interpreted as an argument that the Christian church has superseded and replaced the Jewish nation as God's true people. However, it is in fact an argument that from the beginning, the faithful always were Christian, even though the majority of the nation of Israel failed to understand their own scripture's proclamation of Christ. Like Ignatius, the bishop of Antioch, who died in the Colosseum at Rome, Rome Barnabas held that the Old Testament was originally intended as a Christian book. Both Ignatius and Barnabas saw that. Both saw that unless the original authors of the scriptures had intended to teach the Christian gospel, then Christians could validly be accused by Jews of reading an alien meaning back into those scriptures. And here we'll bring that to a close and do one more as we bring this point to a close. And we're now reading uh, Shirley or Sharon Baker's diatribe against Anselmian view of the atonement. In the same vein, Aquinas, who kind of who accepted largely a uh, Anselm's view of the atonement with a little more clarity, but in the same school of the penal vicarious substitutionary atonement, which Sharon Baker is dissing. In the same vein, Aquinas adds that if God wanted to free man from sin without any satisfaction at all, he would not have been acting against justice. If he then forgives sins, which is a crime in that it is committed against him, he violates no rights. The man who waives satisfaction and forgives an offense done to him acts mercifully, not unjustly. If forgiveness without satisfaction falls under the rubric of justice, then not to forgive or forgive while demanding satisfaction may be considered unjust. And there's the nub of it. She doesn't want justice connected with the work of Christ, which makes the death of Christ totally unnecessary. And also detracts, extracts, removes God's justice, which is at the heart of Sharon's claim. On the other hand, the ideas of satisfaction that include greedy ingredients of violent economic contract, she likes the word violent, 
retribution or payment are unjust at the least and at most absurd. Aristotle articulates the absurdity well when he indicates that the gods seem absurd if they make contracts and return deposits. On the other hand, non-economic forgiveness or pardon is a gift, not an absurdity. The medieval theologian Peter Abelard also speaks of justice in harmony with mercy and love. He says that the justified for free means that you are justified not because of your outstanding achievements or gains, but thanks to God's mercy who was the first to love us. And in the time of mercy, it is God's justice that he gives us. And by the way, Abelard denied the Anselmian view of the atonement. So Sharon is here reflecting a thousand year old argument from Princeton Theological Journal of 2007. Abelard makes clear that through love and in mercy, the forgiveness of sin without condition or compensation fulfills divine justice. Our justification through loving forgiveness is just. It serves to satisfy justice and is a gift from God. But again, never explaining the connection to the cross of Christ, making the cross of Christ a ridiculous non-event. And this was understood in Abelard's time, by the way. And it's been a modern feature of the decadent theologians for the last hundred years easily, if not 150 years, for some. A gift is something freely presented to another. I do not give a gift and expect payment for it. Similarly, if we truly forgive one another, we do not ask for retribution at the same point. Continental philosophers and theologians like Jacques Derrida and John Caputo assert, however, that as imperfect human beings, We are never free from mechanisms of economies of exchange. A perfect gift does not exist in the realm. Our notions of justice are similarly infected with conceptions of revenge, retribution, and economies of exchange that demand the balancing of books. Aquinas comments on the character of gift-giving, which includes for giving, saying that a gift is literally a giving that can have no return. He continues by telling us that the basis for such giving is love, the very love that effects our atonement in the passion of Christ. And we'll draw this to a close. The Lord be for us, who can be against us. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We would just add, in response to this article in Princeton Theological Journal, that this is why we maintain our studies in the Book of Romans and will, God willing, for the rest of life, because the Book of Romans comments on the uh, poverty of her analysis, which is a lot of words which run way outside Pauline theology. That's why we call the Bible the canon, the capital C, the standard, the measuring, the yardstick, uh, and other the carpenter's measuring tape. We'll be back again, God willing. Godspeed, and good to see you, Mary.